All right. Good evening and welcome everyone to our informational session this evening on applying for the Environmental Justice Impact Grants and the Michigan Justice 40 Accelerator. Uh, glad to see so many of you on tonight. We got about 140 logged in. We got many more registered, so I'm sure a lot of more people will be hopping on as we get things started. My name is Jim Ostrowski and I work for the Environmental Support Division at Eagle. And uh, so welcome. I'm just going to be going through a couple of the housekeeping guidelines and helping behind the scenes this evening. Be so before I turn it over to Regina, just a couple things to cover. Uh, first of all, all the lines are muted at this point. So uh, yeah, you can hear us, but we can't hear you. Uh, we, we are recording this webinar. So for a lot of people that couldn't attend, we will be putting this up on YouTube and you'll all be getting everyone, not only those who attended, but everyone who registered, We'll be getting an email from us with a link to recording, and it'll also be posted online. Also keep an eye on the chat because we might be uh, putting a couple things in the chat this evening that you'll find of interest. Oops. Uh, if you have a question tonight for us, you can type it into the Q&A box on your Zoom toolbar, or if you'd rather, uh, you can click the raise hand icon and that'll indicate you want to ask a question, and we will unmute you so you can ask your question. But we will be holding host or holding the Q&A until after we're done with the presentation. So if you have a question, you can think of it. Feel free to type it into the chat or into the Q&A box, and we'll come to it later. Or uh, wait to the end, and you can raise your hand and ask your question that way. I'm um, just checking to see if anybody's on the phone and doesn't look like it. If someone is on the phone, you can hit pound two, and you can raise your hand that way as well. All right, that's all I got. So I'm going to turn it over to Regina Strong with the Office of Environmental Justice Public Advocate. And go ahead, Regina. And I think, Kate, you can go ahead and share your slides. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our informational webinar on the Environmental Justice Impact Grants and the Michigan Justice 40 Accelerator. Very exciting news that both of these programs are launching right at the same time. I think there is a great opportunity for impact in communities across the state. So we're very excited to share the information with you. And as you know, you think of questions, you hear things as we present, please feel free to put the questions in the chat, as Jim said, so you don't forget them. Because we're going to wait till after both presentations um, to have the Q&A sessions. So I wanted to give you a little information about who you'll be hearing from tonight. So I will be speaking about the em Environmental Justice Impact Grants. Kate Hutchins, who is part of the team at the Office of the Environmental Justice Public Advocate and manager of our Impact Grants, you'll hear from Kate as well. You'll also hear from Hudson Villeneuve, Senior Program Manager for Justice 40 at Elevate Energy. Latia Leonard, um, who is Justice 40 Manager with the Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition. And Kate Madigan, who has been working on building the program for our Michigan Justice 40 Accelerator and is working directly with the Office of Climate and Energy and my office to help us move this forward. So you'll hear from us all this evening. All right, so without further ado, I guess we'll get going with the presentation so that we have plenty of time for questions um, as we get through. So as, you, as you've heard, I'm Regina Strong and I'm the Environmental Justice Public Advocate. Next slide, Kate. So I just want to give you a little background on the Office of the Environmental Justice Public Advocate. So the office was created by executive order. Governor Whitmer created the office back in 2019. Seems like only yesterday, but it's been a very eventful five years, um, five plus years that we have been working to integrate environmental justice into how Michigan does what it does across the state. In that same executive order, Governor Whitmer created the Interagency Environmental Justice um, response team. And so in that team, um, there are representatives from departments across state government who've been meeting monthly since July of 2019 to um, address environmental justice 
challenges across the state in an intergovernmental way, kind of all a government approach. And then in February of 2020, we created uh, the Michigan Advisory Council on Environmental Justice, or as you've probably heard us refer to it, the MAC-EJ. And that group uh, started meeting in 2020. So we work the team um, at the OEJPA, as we call it, because of course in government, we have to make an acronym out of everything. Um, that team works on environmental justice concerns, works with um, tribal governments and communities across the state. Next slide, Kate. So let's get to the nitty gritty about um, EJ Impact Grants. So the Michigan legislature and Governor Whitmer approved $20 million to go toward impact in communities. It's the state's first ever environmental justice focused grant, although many of the, fund, the grants and the other funding that the state provides has impact. This is specifically designed to work in communities with environmental justice concerns. And our office worked to design a program that should be um, simple to apply for, um, not a very complicated application, but I wanna get into telling you more about who's eligible and how the program works. Next slide. So the goal is to reduce environmental health burdens and impacts in communities across the state and to have positive impact, really place-based impact, um, and really provide funding for equity-focused projects in a variety of ways. So there's a wide range of applications for this funding so that we can have impact because there we know there are commonalities between communities, but there are a lot of unique features and unique issues that communities are looking to address. Next slide, please. So broadly, the project categories are any community project to improve public health that can have that impact in a community, pollution monitoring, non-regulatory monitors, you know, um, just air filters, purple um, air sensors, other types of community-based pollution monitoring, um, water-based monitoring or sampling. So the creativity you bring to the applications is really how we expect to be able to broadly share the funding in um, a wide range of communities. In addition, the indoor air quality in schools and daycare. I wanted to talk a little bit about how, how that particular category came to be. Um, prior to the pandemic, there were lots of um, there were there were lots of communities or several communities that had concerns about the air quality in schools, particularly schools in close proximity to emitting facilities or potential um, air quality issues. Then the pandemic came and it became a bigger issue. So during the pandemic, there was funding available for schools to do air, indoor air quality assessments. Fast forward, now we have funding to actually help do some of the improvements that would make the air safer for children in schools and daycares. So that's kind of the impetus for that category. Um, and then blight and contaminated site cleanup. So removal of blight, um, opportunities to repurpose some of those sites can also um, fit into this category. So there are a lot of ways that this funding can be used to impact communities. Next slide. So let's talk about who's eligible. So all federally recognized tribes in the state, community-based nonprofits, including grassroots and frontline organizations, schools, institutions of higher learning or higher education, and local governments. So Wanting to uh, just give you a little sense of our timeline. So the application is open now. The deadline um, for us to receive applications is July 15th. Our goal is to make award selections and have 
all the project in 20 September of this year. And then there's a three year window to complete the projects. And the goal is to have those projects completed by September of 2027. And really our opportunity, our window of opportunity to really get the projects done is really, really important. And so we're hopeful with the July 15th deadline, we can get folks off and moving before the end of September. Next slide, Kate. So I'm gonna have Kate go a little into the details of the application so you can learn more about what we expect to receive. I will say that we have shared um, both this two-page program overview, which is available on our website, printed copies have been shared in a lot of different spaces, but all of the information on the grants, um, all of it is available in English, Arabic, and Spanish. And so our goal is to reach across the state to as many communities as possible who may want to participate in applying for the funding. Um, Kate, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Kate um, Hutchins is going to give you a little detail on what the application needs to include, okay? Thanks, Regina. Yeah, we have an abundance of Kates on this call. Uh, I uh, want to let you all know that we're going to share these slides uh, and those will come with the follow-up email that's going to go to all of the registered attendees. And so that's part of why these fonts look a little funky or the font color because these, these are all links. So you'll have access to all of the links um, through the slide deck, as well as being able to go to the website that was put in the chat earlier. So I just wanted to make note of that. So in addition to having this two page program overview in these three languages, we do also have the complete program guide available in all three languages. And I've got my print copy here and it the whole thing is, let's see, about 10 pages for the actual program guide. Uh, so it's not a whole ton to dig through in terms of uh, how some grants can be set up. And then there are a couple of appendices in that program guide that really gives some detail about a couple of the requirements for the application. So there are three pieces that go with this application. And I'm going to talk through every piece because uh, it would be a real bummer if we didn't get all three pieces from everybody. So. The first thing is an application form, which is essentially a cover sheet, but it's got a, a like a signature line that where a person who's um, kind of the, the actual applicant authorized signature, uh, sig signer for the, the application, as well as a couple of other fields. There's a project work plan, which has a much more narrative part of the application. And there are some very specific things that we're asking people to tell us about in that work plan. And then there's uh, the project cost detail, which includes a budget template that we are we have kind of specified for applicants, as well as a budget narrative. So the application form. I'm I'm going to I'm really trying to be very clear like you need all of these pieces so I'm I put all the pages here so people can be like yep got all my four pages uh so each of these has fields that need to be completed this is a PDF that's available from the website and that this will need to be signed and submitted as essentially as I said a cover sheet for the other pieces uh and there's there's one thing um we got a question about word limits and page limits so as you'll see in the program guide, there is a 10 page limit to the project work plan. And we're gonna get into the five sections that comprise that work plan. But there's one section on this form that we're hoping people can keep to 250 words. Uh, and that is just essentially an abstract for your project of this brief project summary. It's very tiny here on the slide, I apologize for that. Um, but, and probably you can't see my cursor. We'll see if that shows up for folks. But uh, that's the one thing that is word limited. Everything else is a page limit. And that page limit only applies to the project work plan. And there, you'll see, when you go through the program guide, you'll see a bunch of things that says, this does not apply to your project work plan, 10 page limit. This does not apply. So, so keep a lookout for that when you're going through the materials. So 
As I previewed, the project work plan has five sections. The first is the project narrative, and that is essentially telling us the story of, of what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it. And there are some specific questions listed in the program guide around what those um, what that is meant to tell us. And uh, we hope that everybody will set up their work plan. We require, in fact, that everybody will set up their work plan according to these sections so that we can really understand what it is that you are hoping to, to fund with these grants. Because we really want to know the whole story and we really want to um, make sure that we understand your good ideas so that we can help you make them real. The, the second section is linkage to impacted community, which is talking about the environmental justice community, the vulnerable populations, the overburdened communities that your project is meant to improve the lives of. And with that is required a My EJ Screen report. And there are instructions for how to produce that report um, in the program guide as well. And I'm gonna to point to that in a minute. Then there's a section that gives more details on the very specifics about what we're asking you to tell us about what you're gonna do the project activities, the deliverables, target dates. And then we have a template, it's pretty basic, that we're hoping everybody will fill out. We're I keep saying hoping, we're requiring everyone to fill out to tell us about how you're gonna set up your project in terms of the timeline. Um, we have three years on that template, you'll see it in a second. So I'll hold that, I'll hold that until we get there. Um, another section is partnerships and community engagements. Again, each one of these sections has specific questions that are going to be asked. Oh, and back up, sorry, back up to the project activities section, section three. Each, there are four categories like Regina talked about for this grant. And there we have a few questions that everyone will need to answer regardless of what category you're applying for funding to, to what category your project falls into. And then depending on what category your project aligns with, there are specific questions. So there are different questions for pollution monitoring projects as opposed to blight or, or contamination remediation projects. So uh, be mindful and attentive to which questions are specific to your category so that we make sure that we have all the information we need to evaluate um, the, the different pieces of the application. Uh, Moving back to partnerships and community engagement, again, specific questions there. And then programmatic capability asks things about, um, you know, what, what, how do you demonstrate that you are able to do what you're saying that you want to do? Uh, and that uh, is the last piece. So the My EJ Screen Report, this is this thing on the left here is the instructions that are in the program guide. And then this thing on the right is what this report is going to look like that is part of what you're going to submit as an appendix to your application. Uh, so it has a map and then a bunch of tables of data of the different variables from my EJ screen. And then as I said, the project timeline template, it has these three years, but not every project is gonna be a three-year project. So only use the pieces of this that you need to use. Um, it might be, you might be proposing a one-year project or a two-year project or a three-year project. And then after the work plan, that's all the work plan stuff. Now we have the project cost detail. So that's piece three of the three pieces, application form, project work plan, Project cost detail. The project cost detail has a budget table. Again, we've set it up for you. It's on the website to download. It's an Excel file to download and put in the information. And then there's a narrative to go along with that. There's a few questions in the program guide about what we wanna know about the, the, the way you describe how the budget aligns with the activities. Uh, and then if you have additional documents, say you have estimates from a contractor or a vendor for part of the project that you're planning to do, it's really helpful if you can attach those so that we can understand where those costs estimates are coming from. So this is a look at what the detailed budget template table template looks like. This is this is not really three pages, but I couldn't scroll down on my slide. So it's actually just category sections with rows. For those of you who glaze over at spreadsheets, I hope you can either power through it or you have somebody to help you with this part. Um, but the, it's pretty simple and it does the math for you. 
Once you put in numbers in the rows, it'll do the adding and the multiplication for you. So I think, Regina, I think I'm handing it back over to you to, to summarize here. Is that is that right? That is right. And All I right. think, um, you know, the biggest thing uh, that I want to make sure I know questions are already populating. And so, you know, there are some things we may answer quickly in the chat before we get to um, our open Q&A session. But I will say that reminders that we want to keep in mind. The max is 500,000 per applicant. Um, so community organizations, nonprofits, uh, frontline organizations, tribes, schools, local governments can all apply as a reminder. Reminder of the July 15th um, deadline. We really want to um, emphasize that. I know it's coming soon. It's almost a month away. Um, we are hopeful that this application is simple um, enough where you can achieve that. And we under we know that there are a lot of different funding opportunities right now. So we're hoping this can both support, initiate, layer a broader project, a new project, an existing project. We're looking at all the different ways that it can be leveraged um, in a community. So I think that's it on the grant presentation for now. Um, Want to make sure, and, and we will, there are a lot of links here and we've got a, a, a QR code, um, the EJ Impact Grant website. Again, those are links, but you can reach it all from our page, which is michigan.gov slash environmental justice. Um, as well as our email box. And we're gonna share these slides so you all will have them. Um, so with that, oh, and the one other thing is we really want you to subscribe and there'll be information later to join our um, kind of listserv for lack of a better word or email list. I sound um, kind of throwback to call it a listserv. I don't know if anybody calls it that anymore, but. Um, our email, our email list. So I think that's the wrap up on the environmental justice impact grants. And so I want to hand things over to Kate Madigan to really give us kind of an overview of the Justice 40 Accelerator coming together, the Office of Climate and Energy and the work that this fits into in that broader picture. So Kate, take it away. Thank you, Regina. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is also Kate, Kate Madigan, and I'm a consultant supporting the Office of Climate and Energy to develop the Michigan Justice 40 Accelerator Program. We are really excited about this program and how it can both help our state meet and exceed the Justice 40 goals and also to implement the My Healthy Climate Plan. So I want to start by framing how this program connects to the My Healthy Climate Plan. As you probably know, the My Healthy Climate Plan is the guiding document for the work of the state of Michigan's Office of Climate and Energy. And the plan's primary goals, um, next slide, please. I think we could. Thank you. The primary goals of the plan are to reach carbon neutrality by 2050, and to get there to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 52% by 2030, and then to do this in a just and equitable manner. And we're also working to do this by creating good paying jobs, addressing environmental injustices related to climate, improving health outcomes, and mitigating the worst impacts of climate among a couple of other objectives. Um, next slide, please. The Office of Climate and Energy is tasked with implementing the My Healthy Climate Plan with guidance from the Council on Climate Solutions and the office came up with five strategies or priorities to guide how to implement this. Two of those strategies are to capture as much federal funding as possible and to support Justice 40 communities to build capacity. And the program, the Justice 40 Accelerator Program that you're about to hear about is the key initiative coming from the Office of Climate and Energy to address that priority. And our theory is that to implement the My Healthy Climate Plan in a just and equitable way, we must build capacity for Justice 40 communities in Michigan through a program like this. 
So in addition, I just wanna mention that there are several other programs the Office of Climate and Energy is leading and leading engagement opportunities are, are coming up. There's the Climate Pollution Reduction Grants. There's the Michigan Solar for All program, which is a five-year program that's being developed this year to bring solar to low-income and disadvantaged communities. There's also other programs in the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. And there's the My Healthy Climate Core program, the first cohort launched in March, and there's a second cohort that will be opening soon. You can learn more about these on the Office of Climate and Energy website. And so the, the Michigan Justice 40 Accelerator Program exists within this broader context. And the feedback that the Office of Climate and Energy receives on all of these programs and efforts informs all of the others. So finally, before I hand it over, I just wanna thank everyone who provided input throughout the process of designing the Justice 40 Accelerator Program, including the Michigan Advisory Council on Environmental Justice. We developed this program working super closely with the Office of the Environmental Justice Public Advocate. It's a joint program. And there was then an open bidding process and Elevate Energy was selected as the organization to operate the program. Elevate also runs the National Justice 40 Accelerator. So they bring a wealth of knowledge and experience to this work, as does the Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition, who's partnering with Elevate on this. And we're so excited that this program is about to launch. So without further ado, I will hand this over to Hudson Villeneuve with Elevate Energy to talk about the Michigan Justice 40 Accelerator. Thank you so much, Kate, and thank you to Eagle uh, for having us on this webinar. We are so excited uh, to launch this program soon. Um, the Justice 40 Accelerator, like Kate said, uh, has been run on the national level to give seed funding and technical assistance support to community-based organizations uh, to access federal clean energy funding. Um, but I'm going to pass it to Latia, my partner, to introduce herself real quick before we dive in. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Latia Leonard. Um, I am the Justice 40 Program Manager with MEJC, or the Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition. Um, just looking really uh, forward to working with Elevate on supporting the community engagement and outreach for this, for this program. Thanks so much, Latia. We can go to the next slide. So a little bit of a roadmap of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what we do with the Justice 40 Accelerator Program, the eligibility for who can apply to be a part of this cohort-based program. Uh, we're gonna talk about the focus areas, what types of projects can get funding from this program. We're gonna talk about the cohort member experience. Um, this is a 12-month program and we'll go over kind of what that 12-month experience looks like, what to expect, uh, the Justice 40 Accelerator journey. We're going to talk about the national program a little bit by the numbers so you can see how successful this has been and why we're taking this model from the national and bringing it here to Michigan. Um, and then you'll have our contact info uh, for follow-up. Moving to the next slide. So again, this is a 12-month deeply relational program. Uh, we will be accepting applications starting uh, this upcoming Monday, June 17th. Um, and the application will go live in a few different uh, places, but it'll go live on the Eagle website, which everyone will have access to after this um, program. There'll be a follow-up email sent. Um, and, and we'll be accepting applications from community-based organizations uh, to receive seed funding, um, technical assistance support to apply for clean energy projects. Um, some of the photos you see here right now is from one of the uh, national cohort members um, that happens to be based in Michigan, uh, the St. Suzanne Community Resource Center in uh, Northwest Detroit. And uh, they have been participating in our third national cohort um, and they are working on projects to fund rain gardens, electrify their building and put solar on their roof. And that's just kind of a taste of the type of funding uh, that this program can help you go after from your community organization. Um, we're really excited to bring it to Michigan because uh, we have local Michigan experts like the Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition that are gonna help uh, connect the dots to the complicated layered network that is accessing federal grant work. 
Uh, so this the whole purpose of this program is to help community based organizations overcome barriers uh, to federal funding. I want to back up for one sec and talk about what Justice 40 even is. Um, Justice 40 is uh, an executive order um, from the Biden White House, from the administration, uh, that designates 40% of the benefits from certain federal programs uh, to disadvantaged and frontline communities. And that, that term benefits is a little tricky. Um, it's not strictly defined. Um, and the point of the accelerator is to help fulfill that promise to make sure that funding is going to the communities that traditionally haven't had access to it, to make sure it's not just going to the most well-resourced communities or most well-resourced organizations. So our goal and our mission is to help you all overcome those bar uh, barriers to create um, community-based climate solutions. Um, Justice 40 is not in itself a pot of money or a federal program that has money. It is, again, a promise. And so most of the funding sources themselves come from some recently passed big packages of legislation like the Inflation Reduction Act uh, and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law that are funding dozens and dozens of climate and clean energy and water related projects. Um, there are numerous federal agencies that have tons of different applications with lots of different due dates, eligibility requirements, um, and all sorts of different layers to accessing it from, from just even finding it on the internet is hard. And so our job is to help you navigate that labyrinth and find what funding will work for your project um, so that we can help elevate uh, community-based solutions. Moving to the next slide. So who is eligible to join our cohort program? Um, so nonprofits or tribal serving organizations with 501c3 status or those that have a fiscal sponsor. Um, that's really, really important um, because those are gonna be the eligible entities that, are, that can apply for federal grants. So that's why we have that in there. Uh, we also really strongly encourage organizations led by uh, black, indigenous and other people of color to apply or organizations that serve those types of communities. Uh, we are hoping to uplift, again, frontline environmental justice, Justice 40 communities that haven't traditionally had access uh, to federal funding resources and find ways to take your great community-based solutions and make sure that they can secure federal funding. A really key important part of uh, joining our cohort is having a project identified for what you want to pursue public funding for. Um, I'll go over in a minute um, what types of projects we're looking to get funded, but um, don't feel like you need to have everything fleshed out at this moment. You don't need to have a detailed budget or an engineering assessment done or a solar assessment or anything technical like that. That is going to be our job uh, once you're selected into the cohort to help connect you to those resources um, to be able to do those types of assessments. We just want you to have locally informed community-based opinions for, for different types of projects. So uh, you'll see on our application, which we've worked really hard to eliminate as many barriers as possible, make it simple, easy to uh, fill out that you just need to have an idea and the idea could be as simple as we want to electrify our community center and make it a resilience hub for addressing climate change um, and we're going to help you design that now me and latia are also going to be available as a resource while you're helping fill out these applications so while it is a competitive process and not everyone will be selected for the cohort we're trying to help you make the best application possible as you do that um, real quick, ineligible to apply for the accelerator are higher education institutions, um, governments, businesses, for-profit institutions, and individuals. Now, if you're a community member and you're thinking right now, like, I have a pollution problem in my community, I have um, an idea for a project in my community, but I don't have a nonprofit, reach out to us. We want to help connect you to the organizations that are doing that type of work um and then connecting you to them and hopefully they can apply to be a part of the cohort and your project can still um, become a reality reality because we know that the best climate solutions are the ones that are coming from the communities the most impacted um, again the application is going to launch june 17th so this upcoming monday and the deadline for that 
uh, to get those in will be August 1st. Next slide. Pretty much the same thing of what I just went over. We really need you to have an identified climate related or energy efficiency project. Uh, we want, we need you to operate or serve in a Justice 40 community. And there's a very helpful map from Eagle that shows what the Justice 40 communities are and that will be sent out to everyone. Um, but you'll have an opportunity in your application to talk about uh, why the community that you plan to serve is an underserved community and kind of make the case for why your project is helping serve underserved communities in that. Uh, again, we strongly encourage uh, BIPOC-led organizations to apply for this program. We need you to want to participate in this accelerator because it is a deeply relational program. Um, you'll have the opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one with what we call navigators. Uh, the navigators are myself and Latia, and so we will get to know each other very well over these 12 months as we help you design your project, connect you to technical assistance resources, navigate the federal grant landscape. Um, so the time to, to do that is intensive uh, because federal grants are a lot of work, but that's why we're here to help you overcome those barriers. Um, and then it is a requirement of this program that you uh, apply for at least one federal grant. So if you are planning to apply for this cohort, please be prepared to um, apply for one uh, source of public funding. Next slide. So um, again, the types of projects, uh, and we can get really, really creative with how uh, your projects fit under these categories. So these are just kind of the big categories, um, but they should address climate change, resilient infrastructure for being more resilient to uh, the impacts of climate change. So we can think like flood mitigation, uh, resilience hubs, heating and cooling centers. So folks can have access to uh, heating and cooling during intense impacts from storms that are caused by climate change, clean energy, energy efficiency, clean transportation projects, affordable and sustainable housing, agriculture, food system, the remediation and reduction of legacy pollution, uh, clean water infrastructure, and then training and workforce development programs related to these issues. So there are really unlimited creative ideas to how we can fit your projects into these categories. Um, but again, remember the, co the purpose of the Justice 40 Accelerator is to access federal clean energy funding. So these categories are coming from the types of grants and funding sources that are available. So we do have to fit it into these categories in order to unlock that funding. Um, next slide. And I'll pass it to Latia. All right. Thank you, Hudson. Um, so again, my name is Latia Leonard. Um, I'm with the uh, Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition. Um, and just to talk a little bit about our role as part of this uh, project, um, we will be working really, really closely with Elevate to really support um, community outreach and engagement on this project. And so anything having to do with questions, concerns, uh, information um, about this program, you will certainly be talking to myself and Hudson. As Hudson already said, this will be a, uh, from start to finish, a 12 month, one year experience, which will be deeply relational. Um, all participants who are just for being accepted into the program, you will receive a 25,000 unrestricted award. Um, and that can, as I just said, unrestricted, that can be used for uh, whatever you deem is necessary. And um, in addition to that, uh, participants will also receive 15,000 in technical uh, assistance. Um, while the Justice 40 program, um, I want to emphasize that uh, staff, while we won't be able to directly support with actual grant writing, um, our participants can expect to use the, these direct technical assistance dollars to help assist them with the actual grant writing and other assistance that they may need. Um, in addition to that, um, each Participant will have one-on-one -on -one navigator support. So from me and Hudson, um, whatever you need to like um, help you through this process, we are here for you. Um, in addition to that, uh, we have our monthly workshops and trainings that we will offer as part of this cohort experience. Um, this is just going to be a series of workshops where um, members can expect to receive training on everything from like 
how to access federal funding, um, what opportunities are out there, and even directly connecting with uh, federal employees to learn about what's happening at the national level. In addition to that, um, you can expect this to also be a really social space. We'll have uh, chill and chats and just opportunities for uh, participants to just get to know each other and share and cross-reference um, while in the project. Um, we will have a lot of communication, a robust communication network, just so that we're making sure that everybody has everything that they need. Um, and we also want to make sure that uh, community members are supported through their capacity building. Uh, so whatever that need is financially with setting up uh, your organization to actually receive those grant funds, um, Elevate will definitely be a great resource for getting um, our participants connecting to all of those resources. Um, next slide, please. Um, so cohorts, um, so what to expect, and this is just some baseline things that um, everybody should be uh, really prepared to have as part of their participation in the program. Um, so in addition to whoever is uh, applying for this opportunity on behalf of their organization, we really think that um, participants should have uh, a key designated staff person who will be able to like be the point person for communication and um, engagement activities throughout this um, and would even welcome that be more than just one person. Um, this program is a bit of time, um, so we definitely think that um, having the time and space to engage in all of these activities will be important. Um, you should expect somewhere around four hours between um, the trainings and the peer calls um, uh, for total engagement over a course of a month. And as part of the experience, when you get into the program, we will be working with organizations one-on-one -on -one, uh, to assess like what exactly is the capacity and support needed for each project or project idea. Um, so we'll work really closely to make sure that we're connecting you with the appropriate type of technical, technical assistance you need for your organization. Um, and then in addition to this, um, you know, just want to say that applying to a federal grant is a lot of work. Um, and so um, throughout this process and gearing you guys up for that, um, definitely expect somewhere around 10 to 40 hours of time needed to actually apply for um, a federal grant. Um, and next slide. Yeah, talking a little bit more about the journey. So um, as you enter uh, the cohort, that you, you'll receive that $25,000 stipend to help you build your organizational capacity to help apply for these federal sources of money. During the cohort uh, experience, we will be connecting you to resources uh, that you need to help achieve your project. We'll also be doing webinars and trainings with the cohort members uh, to help you become better connected to organizations that are doing similar work in your area. Um, a lot of um, reasons that community-based organizations uh, do not end up receiving federal funds um, is because they are not working with other organizations around them to do joint applications to to do some of the same work that they that they're all trying to accomplish. So we're going to help connect you to organizations doing the same work. It may be in your best interest to do a joint uh, application with another community-based organization. It may not. We're here to help you figure that out. Um, so you'll have a great network of people doing the same type of work in your area through this cohort experience. We're going to have workshops and peer learning sessions. Uh, we'll be bringing people in from the state government, from the federal government, Department of Energy, EPA, EGLE, experts who have worked at these agencies and are now retired and are maybe doing other things and are helping people write grants, maybe people who wrote the legislation or designed the program um, itself to help give you insight on how to write the best applications. 
Um, and again, we'll be doing the one-on-one -on -one technical assistance support uh, from that 15K. So we'll be connecting you uh, to TA providers that we have vetted and know are great on this uh, project. That 15K and uh, TA support can kind of be used however you best see fit. Um, it could be used to do a solar assessment for a project. It could be used to do a building electrification audit. It could be used to help get your budget in order. Um, it can be used for a lot of different things that help you grow your organizational capacity uh, to receive this um, federal grant money. Um, and then once the cohort closes, you'll be part of an alumni network. Um, you'll have access to continued like grant resources, funding resources, and connections with, with the community-based organizations. Uh, next slide. So here's a little bit of that timeline. Um, so once we review the applications, uh, cohort will start this September. Uh, we will be working with you one-on-one -on -one to assess your strengths, your priorities, your goals, and come up with a plan to apply for federal funding. Uh, we'll be doing those trainings throughout the fall and winter to uh, help you get ready to apply for federal funding. And then uh, we'll be matching you with appropriate grants. And, and we know the deadlines for these things. So if there's stuff that is due closer to September, we'll work with you to get that in quickly. If there's stuff that's not due later on, you know, we'll develop a larger plan. I know the um, community change grants are on a lot of folks' minds and those are due in November. So that'll definitely be something that we'll be working on with folks. Um, and then um, by September of 2025, uh, we'll be celebrating success, and I want to show everyone what some of that success has looked like uh, from the National Accelerator. Um, so next slide. So, and this only includes the first two national cohorts. The third national cohort is, is still ongoing, but in the first two, uh, we supported 165 grant applications, um, that were that totaled $42 million and secured funding with an 81% award success rate, which we're really, really proud of. And um, again, we're here to make sure that our cohort members get funding and make an impact in their community. Um, so we're hoping to translate this to Michigan. And uh, we will be funding um, for transparency 25 community-based organizations in this program, which we're really, really excited about. And uh, we look forward to working with Eagle and MEJC to implement this program. And you can find our contact info on the next slide. Um, please feel free to email me or Latia uh, with your questions. We're going to answer some questions coming up here. Um, but if it's a more detailed thing, we're happy to set up a one on one meeting as you go through the cohort process. And again, as a reminder, uh, June 17th, we're launching the application this upcoming Monday. And then um, the, the applications will be due August 1st. So thank you, Eagle, for having us. And uh, I think we can uh, jump into questions. Or maybe I'm passing it to Regina. So just a quick wrap up as we transition over to questions and folks can get their, I see a few hands raised already. I know Jim's gonna, grab the hands and help moderate the questions. But these are some of the dates that you heard. Again, you will receive these slides. Thank you so much, um, Hudson and Latia, for giving that great overview of the exciting new Michigan-focused Justice Accelerator. And uh, July 15th is the reminder for the grant date. We also have, as you mentioned, Hudson, um, a lot of opportunities out there right now. One of the things that we're hoping to do, and we don't want to confuse you by giving too much information about too many different things, but there are a few things coming up that we want to make sure we mentioned. Um, there are community energy management grant applications that are due and the My Clean School Bus grants um, that the um, Michigan Department of Education has out, and those are due July 12th, as well as the community change grants that you've heard a lot about. There's also a My Climate Justice Challenge where the state of Michigan is looking to support those who apply for the community change grants by August 1st with a 5% capacity funds match. So based on um, what is awarded, 
you have to receive the award first from the EPA and then the state is, is pitching in um, with a 5% capacity fund support to help you fulfill the requirements of that grant. And we know the Great Lakes Thriving Communities Environmental Justice Grants are coming soon. So there's a lot of funding coming through and a lot of support, which is really exciting. So just wanted to flag these um, other opportunities. We will be uh, sharing the slides so you'll have this information, but wanted to bring those up. And so, Jim, I will turn things over to you to help moderate the questions. Hey, Regina, thank you. And yeah, we got a lot of questions in. It looks like... Um... Both the Cates and um, we're answering a lot of them as we went through here. So I'm just kind of flipping through a couple of them. Um, one that uh, came in right up front, Regina, was somebody was asking, how can the public and community community anchor institutions weigh in the project categories that are being considered and prioritized? So because the funding was created by the legislature, there were very specific categories outlined in the legislation. And that is the, the genesis of the categories that are included in the grant. Although along the way, we've worked to get feedback from a variety of entities on you know, how um, to develop the grants and the application, but the categories were outlined in the legislation um, that created the funding. Right. I uh, want to point everybody's attention to the chat because we did drop a bunch of links in the chat for tonight. So make sure you check that out if you haven't already. Uh, this person's asking, are community de development financial institutions, CDFIs, eligible? I think that, that's always under the impact grants. So one of the things I'd say, and this is a question, um, kind of a question in response to a question, is really it's focused on 501c3 organizations. And I'm not sure the category that community development financial institutions fall into, if they fall into any of the existing categories. So that's yeah. one thing I will say. Kate Hutchins may be putting more information in, in as an answer more specific to that question. Right, right. Uh, this person is asking, I'm not sure it's more for um, Elevate team or for Regina and Kay, but this person is asking, how can I get on the technical assistance list as an architect, for example? So I'll, I'll jump in first and just talk a little bit about um, the categories definitely could probably use as people are working on building teams. My guess is these will mostly be collaborative applications. So connecting with community organizations who are looking to focus on blight or focus or local governments who are looking to focus on a blight related or redevelopment project seem like the category where that would fit. Um, we don't have a running technical assistance list at this time to connect um, with, but that would be my recommendation there. Great. Uh, this one I think is for Hudson. Uh, does the project that we identify have to be completed in a 12 month period? No, not at all. Um, just You just have to apply for it or have a plan to apply for it yeah. within the 12 month cohort uh, period. The project could take years essentially if, if that's the type of project that it is some of these are are pretty intricate projects um but the only requirement is that um you apply for the funding yeah yeah the questions are coming in fast and furious now everybody <laughs> bear with me um how can we learn of other nonprofits or community groups doing similar work that we want to, that we may want to partner with Yeah, that's a great question. It is one of the goals of our cohort. Uh, so the, the selected cohort members will definitely be connected to um, groups. I, I know that doesn't, that's not a super satisfying answer, but um, we hope to be as transparent about as possible and create resource lists that will be given to all the folks that apply. And there'll be Michigan specific funding resource lists that are available for everyone, um, even if you aren't selected into the cohort. All right. Uh, we do have a few people who are patiently waiting with their hands up, and they have been. Um, 
go to Beth London first. Beth, uh, we have unmuted your line on our end. So I know we probably surprised you, <laughs> but uh, Beth, if you have your question, you can go ahead and unmute your line and ask it. If not, that's fine. I'll give you a second. There you go. Go ahead. Go ahead, Beth. You can ask your question. You're unmuted. May not be working. Well, we're going to go to the next person. So, Beth, if uh, you have a question, feel free to type it into the into the chat bar there. Uh, Cheng Ming, you have a question. I'm unmuting your line, so you can go ahead and unmute your line and ask your question. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay, good. First of all, I think you guys did a great job. I'm really moved and educated and encouraged. Thank you, Regina Strong and uh, Mr. Hudson and uh, Katie. I try to remember the other lady. I do not have much question. I just want to to let you know I learned quite a lot and uh, I really appreciate it. I encourage, by the way, I encourage everybody to be proactive, participate in the trainings, which is very important. And uh, until you get this training or participate meeting, such as MHCC at Lansing, and you just really do not know how this wonderful program led by Eagle and also, one last comment about the local government and local schools. It doesn't look like many people from local governments such as Ann Arbor City and Saline City and the local schools such as Saline Area schools they even know about this magnificent program, MHCP, led by governor. And I think Probably you guys have to be doing something. And that's all. Thanks. Thank you again. I have no more questions. Okay. Thanks, Chaming, for your comments. Uh, uh, Asia, Asia Jones? Yes. Um, right. My question is actually kind of brief. I tried to ask in the chat, but I don't think my question was clear. Um, I wanted to know... Uh, Actually, it's a twofold question regarding the um, grant application uh, or excuse me, the cohort. Um, number one, what uh, what of the I saw the eligibility requirements that you guys um, gave on the slide. Like you have to be a five hundred one c three, and it sounds like a project that it needs to be a project that you guys believe in. Are there any other eligibility requirements? And for the fifteen thousand dollar technical assistant grant. Um, is that covering some type of meant to use to cover some type of application cost for the federal grant? Could you clarify? Yeah, yeah. There's um, there's no other requirements besides being a 501c3 or having a fiscal sponsor from a 501c3. Um, and I think you mentioned something else. Serving uh, serving a Justice 40 community is the other the other requirement that we have. Mm -hmm. Um. The fifteen thousand uh, dollars in technical assistance can be used in a variety of ways. So we have mm -hmm. grant writers through that we have vetted. If you want to use your fifteen k to actually write your grant, uh, we can use it for that purpose. It can be used to help you do assessments for your project, like engineering mm -hmm. assessments, solar mm -hmm. assessments, building audits, things like that. Uh, mm. It can help you with uh, your your tax structure or your budgeting um, if that helps you achieve the goals of uh, fulfilling the grant. Um, so there are numerous ways and we have a directory of experts that we keep on tabs. So we'll work with you one on one to figure out uh, what what the best way to use that funding for your group is. OK, so just so I'm clear, the app, the uh, application will open up on June 17th for this Pro cohort program? Correct. Correct. Awesome. Okay. And la and this really is my last question. Um, after we submit, let's say a person is accepted, um, we won't find out until September. Um, towards the end of August, early September, yeah, around right around then. Thank you. Yep. And our door is always open. If you have questions as you're going through the application, feel free to shoot us an email. 
All right. Thanks for your question. Uh, we've got a couple more hands raised, but I want to jump back over to the Q&A box. And um, uh, Kate Hutchins, feel free to chime in too. If you see some you want answers, we got a lot of them in there. Um, this one I want to address. It's a long question, but I'm just going to get to kind of the gist of it. Hopefully, uh, if you want more details, you can probably talk to anybody directly. But I think it's a good question. It says, my project fits into both categories, A and D. Is it okay to apply for a project in two categories? This is under the impact grants. So uh, Kate, do you want to respond to that one? I am happy to do that. And and we've had a few questions like this uh, through, through other channels as well um, before tonight. And there is no restriction on, like there's no categorical limit on how many categories you can include in your application. Uh, there, I guess the, the best thing I would say is to make sure that you're tying the pieces of the project to the category specifically, and that you answer, if that makes sense, like one chunk of the project is applicable to this category and another chunk is applicable to that category. And so that that's clear to those who are going to be reviewing the application and also to, um, make sure that each of the category uh, category specific questions around the activities are answered for both of those categories relative to the two chunks of the project. That's the wrong word, but I think, I hope I'm getting across clearly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks, Kate. Um, person is asking, are you able to review proposals for input before the final submission? So I think it'd go for either of you. Can you review? the proposals before final submission? So from the EJ impact grant standpoint, we will not be reviewing them beforehand um, because we are a small but mighty team and we're pulling in a lot of other, other folks. So we try to provide as much information as possible. You can reach out to us if you have questions, um, but because this is a new venture for us all, we really wanna see, um, creativity and we're trying to give as much guidance. We want to see things that will impact community, but we will not be specifically reviewing applications before submitting. Yes. Thanks. And uh, uh, similarly with the accelerator program, we want to help you uh, answer any questions you may have uh, during the application process. But as it is competitive, you know, we can't formally write the application for you. Um, um, in fairness, because uh, it's it's a limited source of funding, um, but we really do want to overcome barriers. So we don't want anything in the application that you may be confused about to prevent you from applying. So we will help get you the answers to your questions on the application. All right, thanks. Let's go back to, and by the way, uh, it is just a little after seven. We do have this webinar scheduled to 7.30. So we're gonna keep going through questions up until 7.30. Uh, but if you do have to take off or leave, don't worry, we're, we are recording this webinar and we'll send a link out and all the good information that you need uh, following. So you can catch it there. All right, going over to our phones or our uh, hands raised. Anne has had her hand raised for a while. So go ahead, Anne. You can ask your question. You're unmuted. Yes, uh, this is for the EJ Impact Grant. I was wondering if you are partnering with other community organizations and grassroots organizations who don't have a 501c3, but you do, is that okay? Oh, I couldn't get off mute. <laughs> um, yes, it's ab absolutely okay. And we encourage partnering. Um, we know that a lot of the true environmental justice, frontline advocates, may or may not be part of a 501c3. Um, so we encourage um, partnering and um, working together uh, to achieve. So that's a great question. And yes, partnering is good. Great, thank you. You're welcome. All right, thanks for your question. Yeah, we do have a lot of comments and questions in here about partnering with other people, knowing what other organizations are available to partner. So you're gonna see a lot in there. And we will be sharing all the questions that came in with our team here. So if we don't get to your question, don't worry. The team will have access to them shortly after here. Uh, 
what support exists for building J40 programs alongside CBOs and local governments? Can contractors working with NGOs take advantage of this program? There's a lot of acronyms in there. <laughs> so I don't know, Hudson or Alatia, do you want to yeah, answer that one? I might need to read that one. Can we? Yeah, I'll read it for you. It's kind of buried deep in our Q&A box. Uh, what support exists for those who are building J40 programs alongside CBOs and local governments? Can contractors working with uh, non-government organizations take advantage of this program? Can contractors working with non-government? Well, um, you know, if you are a local Michigan contractor, um, I think, you know, it's going to be part of our job to identify uh, the folks for our cohort members to work with to do certain types of contracting work, general contracting work, um, like HVAC, um, building electrification analysis and, and support there. Um, so, you know, I think there is an avenue for contractors to work with nonprofits. I think there's a lot of help needed there. And if that's something you're interested in, I would encourage you to proactively reach out to some of the NGOs that are doing um, electrification and clean energy work. Um, but there's not an avenue for this for the accelerator itself to, to work with contractors um, in the way I think you see fit. But uh, if I didn't quite answer your question, feel free to shoot me an email and, and I'll answer it in detail. All right. Thanks, Hudson. Uh, and, you know, Kate, Regina, team here, there's a lot of questions, like I said, on partnering with other people, teaming up for things. So if you see something in the Q&A Q Q box you want to address kind of generally on that topic a little bit more, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, I am going to go back to our hands raised. And uh, uh, De Delia, you are unmuted on our end. So you can go ahead and ask your question. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a simple question. Um, I understand the initiative and what's going on, but I just wanted to know if there was like some kind of creative way that maybe recycling, like a recycling program could be um, part of this program. Are you talking about the, the accelerator or the impact grants? With the, well, actually both. No. I'll start with the accelerator. I think there definitely is a creative way that it could be. Um, now, the barrier to that is not um, our program. We love to have creative ideas. It's the federal funding sources that are available. So Understood. Um, we are hoping to connect you to funding. And if there isn't funding related to that type of program idea, we, we um, you know, wouldn't necessarily work with that just because it's not possible to get funding under the current structure and legislation that has passed. But yeah, I'd love to talk more about your project idea. Um, if you want to shoot me an email and we can connect and how that would fit. Okay. And then what's your name again? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm Hudson Villeneuve and I'll make sure um, my email will be sent out, but um, maybe someone can drop it in the chat or we can go back to the slide that had my email on it later. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hudson, we'll drop your email. If Kate, maybe if you can help us drop that in the chat for Hudson's email address. And also, we had a question on there on uh, who they can contact for questions about the impact grant. So maybe, Kate, you can put your email in there or bring back that slide that had the emails on it, uh, one of the two. In any event, we'll be sending out an email. We'll have all those details on there. So if you can wait for a, a day or two, uh, we'll be doing that soon here, too. Okay, back to my list here. Um, we had a good one, but it just got bumped off, I think. Shoot. Uh, we'll go to another one here. Oh, here it is. Okay, for the EGA impact grants, will you consider partial funding if you consider the ask to be too high? So I believe I'm understanding that question to mean if you've asked for more. I think we will look at each grant individually based on the project and the ask and then make um, an award based on, on, on the review of the grant. I mean, I'm sorry, of the application. So I guess that's the best way to describe that because 500,000 is the max you can ask for, um, but your project may need 250,000 or it may need 20,000, or you may apply for that. Um, but that's part of what we hope the work plan and the other pieces of the application will help us evaluate. 
um, how that will be used and you know what impact that could potentially have. So hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, if it didn't answer your question, feel free to reach out directly to um, to Kate. And she did put uh, contact information to the chat. So thanks for doing that. Appreciate it. Um, well, some of these have already been answered by people on the phone. So that's good, or they're already asked by people on the phone. Okay, we have two great ideas that are that we are considering to apply. May we submit two submissions, and or is there a way to vet which idea may have the best opportunity for an award? I think this can go to either of you on that one. So I'll, I'll just start by saying, um, we, as as we mentioned before, aren't directly vetting, like telling people which one, because we we really don't know until we've evaluated the pool of applications. But I will say um, I'm encouraging folks to submit um, their ideas, whatever those are. Um, so I would never say don't submit it if it feels like it fits the categories and you are an eligible applicant. I would encourage you to submit. Yeah, and for the accelerator program, um, we'll be working with our cohort members to apply for probably one source of funding um, and, and working on, on that with you and deciding kind of which one works for, for us on that. But um, please apply for the accelerator program if you have multiple projects. Um, I would just maybe focus on on your best, your best project for the application and then uh, if you're accepted in the cohort, we can kind of work together and see which one has the best federal opportunities uh, with the grants that are available. All right, thanks. Okay, going to our hands raised, uh, Donovan. Donovan, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hi, right, thank you. Uh, great, great talk. Thank you for everybody who's participating. Uh, I just want to get a bit more clarity on you said uh, on who's el what type of what type of entity is eligible for these? Because I remember she, when she started the conversation, she said, um, she said tribal communities, local governance, and uh, what else did she suggest? Uh, she said, um, and in schools. So, could you clarify who's immediately eligible to participate in these? Is that referring to the grants? Yes, to the grants. Okay. So nonprofit organizations and entities. Um, there were questions earlier about partnering. We we do encourage that. Um, but yes, um, tribal communities are eligible. Local governments are eligible. Um, nonprofit organizations and community organizations partnering together are eligible. Um, schools very specific to the air quality in schools category of application. Um, Kate, am I missing? I don't have the slide in front of me. I feel like make, how, how long do these do these nonprofits have to be established? Could they be new? Could they be a couple of years in the game or? Um, it is not delineated at all. So it okay. is more, um, I encourage people to apply. If you have a great idea that will have impact on the community, I encourage you to apply. And Kate, did I miss any other eligible? Uh, institutions of higher education. Oh. Um, and I, I did want to just say that relative to the, you know, kind of how long a, a group has been doing the work, I think that um, there, there are a couple of questions under the, the programmatic capability section and also the partnerships and, and community engagement section that do speak to that. So you, if that if that's a part of um, a, a part of the circumstances of your project or of your team that you want to talk about, please do include that in those parts of the application. Okay, we'll do. Thanks for your question. Thank uh, you. Okay, team, we've got a couple questions in here related for some examples. So a uh, person's asking for examples of projects that are a good fit for EJ impact funding. And also there's a question here about examples of projects that have been successful as part of the J40 program. So could either of you just chime in and give a couple examples that might help everybody define better what we're looking at here? 
Either you can go first. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can jump in. Um, so there, there really is a lot of uh, ways we can design um, projects to fit under the grants, but some that have been awarded have been like building electrification plans, um, community solar projects, um, food related uh, agriculture projects, um, circular economy stuff. So um, we do have a list of the awardees and I have the list of projects. If you're more interested in getting a kind of a detailed thing, I'm happy to to kind of go over that with you. Um, but again, it's been based on primarily the funding that has been trickling down from the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed two years ago. And there have just been numerous grant programs coming down from that ever since that was passed and will continue over the next few years. So um, depending on the time of year, uh, what year it is, it, it will depend on what type of projects are the most, um, will be the most successful in, in, in securing federal funding. Regina or Kate, can you chime in on EJ impact grants types of projects that we're that you're thinking of? So Kate, I'm gonna, ask you to give some of the very broad examples. This is a brave new world. <laughs> and so from the, the categories that we have, we really, really wanna see what we receive because particularly that initial category of um, impacting health and communities, that can be very broad. And um, we wanna see what we get. I don't know if we have any specific examples we can use in that category, but any of the things, for instance, that Hudson mentioned could fit into that category. It just depends on demonstrated impact in the project community. And that's our goal. We want these grants, hence the name, to really have impact in communities. And Kate, I don't know if there's anything else you wanna add from a, an example standpoint. There are a few examples that we've done, and these are hypothetical examples. Uh, these are not something that like has been done with these grants, because like Regina just said, this mm -hmm. has never been, these grants have never been awarded before. Um, but the for that, we have kind of some examples under each category, and uh, maybe we will try to find a way to fit that into follow-up. Um, it's also going to be out, we're putting out an FAQ soon around the around this uh, grant opportunity. So look forward to that information on our website. But the categories we or the examples we have for category A are things like, not specifically these things, but these are some examples, uh, some green infrastructure to reduce flooding in an environmental justice community, uh, or filtration to improve indoor air quality for homes or public buildings in an environmental justice community. Uh, perhaps lead remediation in homes in an environmental justice community. Uh, and there's lots of different things. And the critical piece is going to be tying your project and its activities to improved public health outcomes for the environmental justice community that your project is designed to um, improve those things for. So that's that, like Regina said, we're, we're kind of hoping folks, we're relying on our applicants in some ways to demonstrate that for us because this grant covers a lot of different types of categories. Yes, thank you both for providing that. Okay, uh, looks like Mary Alice has got her hand up. So Mary Alice, you can unmute your line and go ahead and ask your question. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello everyone and thank you uh, for this space. Mm -hmm. uh, it's good to see you again, Regina. I think I've been going to meetings now since 2002. Uh, my question is, will uh, the state and the federal government with these grants, what is, is there a differentiation between them? And will there be a Michigan hub? And if there is, how is that process going to work in choosing one? Thank you. Good to hear your voice, Mary Alice. Um, can you say a little more about the um, Michigan, when you're thinking of a Michigan hub? Um, okay. Tell me what you're thinking. <clears throat> well, as, as I've said, and I've spent the last three or four years on the calls with you. Um, <laughs> and yes. so I've, yeah. um, I, I've been on these calls because I was one with other organizations fighting for this type of funding for our communities. And uh, I know that there's a hub in the midst of, of, of 
of uh, different regions that are broken down federally. And there are some hubs, like one in Chicago and one in okay. Wisconsin on a, in, in southern and California part of the state, as well as the uh, further east. Um, if they have hubs, um, will Michigan have a hub itself to help facilitate these fundings? And if so, what does that look like? How will that process work in choosing where that hub will be and who will be the fiduciary of? So I, I, I believe when you're referring to the um, technical assistance centers or Tic Tacs that yes. the EPA um, has yes. initiated, those are separate from us, but we're working very closely um, with both the Blacks and Green TikTok in Chicago and the University of Minnesota, which I believe they're calling the Great Lakes TikTok. I'm not sure, yes, but I think so. Am I right? Okay. Um, and those entities, we've shared a lot of information. There's a previous webinar we did back in January where we had folks from both TikTok. So we're trying to work very closely with the EPA um, in terms of getting information out to potential Michigan applicants. And so all of this is happening at the same time and overlapping pretty well, as, as Hudson mentioned with, for instance, the accelerator, the goal is to bring more federal money to communities and to folks in Michigan and to give that opportunity. So we won't be doing a separate um, hub or Tic Tac. We have worked to provide support for those who are applying for the federal um, funding as well as support for applying for the state funding. Like we've said many times, it's it's new to us. Um, I think it's new to everyone. All of this funding is new and it's all coming at the same time, like we're all drinking from a fire hose. And so <laughs> as much of an opportunity as we have to help connect folks to support, we are definitely willing to do that. So if, if you are, you know, as part of the effort around just spreading the word on the community change grants, which are the EPA grants, um, we've been trying to connect people. So if you reach out to us and there's information, uh, I don't know, this isn't the slide with our um, um, information, but Kate can add it to the chat. We can try to support and help connect in all the ways that we can. So I really appreciate um, it. Thank yeah, you. absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Thank you, Mary Alice. I'll just add there, Mary Alice, um, it's still the responsibility of the Tic Tacs, the one in Chicago and in Minnesota, to help Michigan out. So even if it's not in Michigan, they are in charge of helping Michigan with technical assistance. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Uh, we're also going to go to Vanessa. Vanessa, you've had your hand up for a while now. You can go ahead and ask your question. Yes. What I wanted to ask, when you're the biggest aspect of your project is, is creating a community hub. Um, and we look at the partnership um, as being a, a, a key component for us. The question is, what do you do when the, the bulk of the, um, the monies are going to be in renovation? It, you know, in terms of the ideal of what our partnering relationship should look like, because it seems like the majority of you know, the relationship is like the contractors doing the work and our engagement with the community to make sure that when our hub is complete, it satisfies the wishes of the community. So I'm a little confused when we look at the partner relationship when you're restoring a dilapidated brick and mortar. So Kate, feel free to jump in if you have thoughts on that. One of the things that, you know, as we thought about this particular category that's really important is there. there's obvious the, obviously the physical work that needs to happen on the site, but there's also all the other things that you mentioned. So the goal would be that your application incorporates both. So there's an opportunity um, to you know, not just have all the money go out the door. We know how hard it is to manage something with limited resources. Um, and so it, the way that you complete the application will dictate and who you partner with and how you build, um, if you have memorandums of understanding or how you build the partnership 
will help dictate who gets the funding and how that works. And so, um, but I would encourage, you know, folks to ensure that it is, it is not just focused on getting the actual physical work because it takes management to get through the whole process. And like you said, reaching out to the community and a lot of other um, aspects of the project. And Kate, I don't know if there's anything you want to add. Well, I, I think it just makes me want to kind of restate the the importance of connecting to connecting your project activities to the outcomes that you're expecting from those activities and making sure that those outcomes align with the with the categories um, purpose and also um, talking about community engagement as there, there are questions about community engagement in one of the sections for the work plan. Forgive me, I can't remember what number section number it is at this point. Um, and, but that that is a part that that we would love to hear everybody talk about exactly that kind of um, engagement and speaking to what the community has articulated as a need as part of the application. Well, we are quickly approaching our end time here, and I just want to be respectful of everyone's time and their evening that they have in front of them, I know. Uh, so we've got a lot of open questions. So I'm going to open it up to Hudson, Kate, Regina, Latia. Did you see anything in here that you still want to address? Reminding everybody that if your question didn't get addressed, don't worry, the team's going to have them. And Kate's creating an FAQ, like she said. So. <laughs> <laughs> If I may, there's one question that came up a couple of times that's kind of specific, but because a couple of people asked it, I wanted to say it out loud for anybody else who's wondering about the um, assessments that are indicated to be part of the indoor air quality in schools category. And that is through, um, and Regina, I know you have more details on the background of this, and I think you mentioned it a little bit earlier, but that is through, there. that's available through a um, state contracted assessment provider or if a if a school has a pre-existing assessment that can be submitted with that application, or if the school wants to hire a provider to do that assessment, um, but that's part of it. Regina, was there more you would want to say on that? Yes, the our energy office within Eagle um, has provided free of charge for schools um, assessments through a program, and we want those assessments to be done as part of that application. So you, even if you haven't had an assessment done already, um, we encourage you to apply um, because that assessment helps identify the needs to, you know, within a HVAC system in the school or the, the air system in the school um, to better identify what's specifically needed because we wanna make sure that the funding is going toward um, you know, the right kinds of things with the right kind of folks doing the work. And so that category is real specific to um, better identifying what, I mean, that assessment, I'm sorry, is, is very specific to identifying what a specific school may need. Okay, well, thank you all. Uh, it is about 7.30, so we need to wrap this up. Like I said, Lots of more questions in there. We had some good, really good comments and a couple of good ideas too in there that I think that a team here will want to take a look at in terms of partnering and things like that. So um, I guess, Regina, did you want to wrap us up with any parting thoughts or words? I want to thank everybody for spending their evening with us. I know our numbers are dwindling. It's getting late. And I appreciate those who hung in till the end. I'm kind of that person that you have to kick out at the end of the party because I'm always having such a good time. So thank you so much. We will definitely follow up with more information on both the EJ Impact Grants and the Justice 40 Accelerator. As we mentioned, we're working on an FAQ, which will be posted or frequently asked questions document that will be posted and please reach out um, to us if there are additional questions. We'll try to answer as many of these and get these back out to you as quickly as we can as well. So I don't know if Hudson, if you have any parting words or Kate Madigan. Just want to remind folks to reach out over email with the questions if yours didn't get answered today and uh, we'll be sending out the application on Monday. All right. Well, thank you to our team 
And thank you to all of you who have stuck around. We still got about 94 people on, so that's pretty darn good. We had over 200. <laughs> uh, yes, just a reminder, we'll be sending out an email in the next couple of days. Uh, be patient because we got to get everything together. But you'll get an email with the link to the recording as well as um, the PowerPoint slides and any other great information that was shared in the chat today and anything else that Kate wants to add in there. So thank you all for joining us. Hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night.